Mr. Anand Nageshwaran, the Chief Economic Advisor of the Government of India, ladies and gentlemen, I think uh, Rekha did well by planning this as the last session of the day. No better way than to keep everyone in the room at the end of a long day. So it's a pleasure to have you all with us and a warm welcome in a session with the Government of India's Chief Economic Advisor, Dr. V. Anand Nageshwaran. Dr. Nageshwaran, it's a privilege to have you with us and many thanks for agreeing to talk to us about balancing the roles of capital and labor in India's economic growth. You've been India's chief economic advisor for more than two years, and you advise the government through a period of great economic trial and triumph. A writer, a researcher, a teacher, and consultant for much of your career, you have brought significant rigor and gravitas to the role of the CEA. You're known as a plain speaking economist, and you've not been shy of speaking your mind. Earlier, between 2019 and 2021, you were a part-time member of the Economic Advisory Council to the Prime Minister. In a stellar career in academics and consulting, you have been the Dean of the IFM, IFMR Graduate School of Business and a visiting professor of economics at Korea University and a research and investment leader at Credit Suisse and the Union Bank of Switzerland. You are also a co-founder of Avishkar Venture Capital Fund and the Takshashila Institution. We look forward to hearing your analysis of the imbalances in the Indian economy and your suggestions to fix those. Many thanks for joining us at the National Management Convention and a very warm welcome to you. Ladies and gentlemen, the Indian economy has done rather well in the post-COVID period and it posted an impressive growth of 8.2% last year. The elections did affect Q1 of this fiscal, but even then the growth dip was only marginal and the World Bank has in fact raised its forecast for India's GDP growth this year to 7% from a mid-6% level. India remains well ahead of China as a growth leader amongst the top economies of the world and is set to become the third largest economy by the end of this decade. The economy is coping reasonably well uh, with the disruption and inflation caused by geopolitical events and corporate profits and balance sheets are in a good shape. Despite the spike in inflation, the manufacturing and construction output grew by nearly double digit percentage last year. The dip in Q1 is expected to be made up as the uh, government is likely to spend in the second half of the year to make up for some of the slack in Q1. The boom in the stock prices is a source of good feeling in the economy and is encouraging private investments in new capacities and technologies. However, that is not the entire picture. The economic survey pointed out that the medium term growth will be qualified by the global trends such as increased geoeconomic fragmentation, and every country pushing for self-reliance, looming climate change, rise of technology as a differentiator, and a shrinking space for policy maneuvers. The survey underscored the need for policy boosters in the area of jobs and skilling, agriculture, MSMEs, corporate bond markets, green transition, relations with China, inequality, and health quality of the population. Even as the economy has grown on the strengths of government investment and spending, corporate and banking efficiencies, and strong consumption, India has struggled to address an issue of jobless growth. While there is no widespread discontent amongst the youth, there is growing social unease about the dearth of formal jobs for the moderately educated. The economic survey highlighted that India needs to create about 8 million jobs each year. The chief economic advisor has expressed his concerns about growing informalization of jobs because of the digital economy, though digitized recording of employment is meant to increase formalization. At the lower end of the labor economy, much of the work is ad hoc with fluctuating payments. While the payroll additions have more than doubled because of the mandatory registration with EPFO, the increasing reliance on gig workers making labor incomes less stable and less secure. Given India's enthusiasm for using more autonomous technology, India is in a cash 22 situation, as it also needs to ensure decent labor income to maintain political stability and lift the GDP growth further. The economists and policy makers have to find ways to resolve this conundrum so that India's growth train is not derailed because of capital and labor imbalance. We are privileged to have Dr. Nageshwaran who thinks deeply about such issues and he advises the government on how best to deal with these challenges. It's my pleasure to invite Dr. Nageshwaran to share his diagnosis of the health of the Indian economy and his prescription for a stronger and sustained growth. Thank you everyone. Welcome to you Dr. Nageshwaran.
Thank you, Mr. Narendran, for those uh, kind words of introduction. Also, a good description of the economic survey. Thank you for reading it. And good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. For a last item on the convention, this topic is a heavy one. The balance between capital and labor. Uh, sometimes when we try to address complex subjects, it makes sense to start from first principles or break it down from there and then get to where we are today. So from the time of independence and for a, several decades after independence as well, we knew that we were a capital staffed country and a country with a lot of labor because the population size was much bigger. And uh, the laws of economics always dictate that what is scarce becomes more valuable or valued more than what is available plentily. That applies to humans, materials, or even feelings and emotions. So from that perspective, since capital was scarce, and at independence, domestic savings rates were low, and much of India's resources had gone to strengthen the economy of the colonial masters, etc. It became necessary to incentivize savings and capital mobilization for investment purposes. And somehow it was expected that village and rural economy and small-scale industries will necessarily therefore be labor-intensive and that is why a lot of manufacturing was reserved for small-scale industries. This was the way governments of the past post-independence tried to balance the mobilization of capital and at the same time employment. But we all know that that strategy delivered us a steady growth rate in real terms of around 3 to 3.5% 3 per annum for about 3 to 4 decades, 3 decades maybe. While countries which had a similar level of per capita income at the time of India's independence forged ahead much more quickly, South Korea for example. And then we also saw many other East Asian nations move from being third world countries to a first world country status within the space of a single generation. And that is when India realized the need for scale. And one of the things which happened in post-1991 reforms, apart from the de-licensing, was also the de-reservation of many products that were meant for small scale industries only. So, but somehow, however, as we went into the post-liberalization phase since 1991, the employment elasticity of our economic growth also kept coming down. Now, employment elasticity is not merely a function of the private sector investing in new businesses or expanding existing capacity. It is a function of technological developments, it's a function of the skill levels of the population, it's a function of government policies to incentivize employment both for the employer and for the employee because sometimes some of our policies which are meant to support the unemployed as continental Europe has discovered over the last several years or several decades is that policies that are meant to support people with their incomes during the periods of unemployment could perversely incentivize them to remain unemployed. If there are no timelines, if there are no uh, terminal dates for such support, then people find on balance that they had greater flexibility with their time and they chose to remain unemployed as well. So that contributed to a structural level of unemployment being higher in the European Union than in the United States. So as you can see here, employment creation is simply not a matter of demand for labor from the industry and supply of the adequately qualified or adequately uh, equipped labor force. It is a function of technological factors. It is also a function of public policies as well. In India, by and large, over the last 
several decades until recently, bulk of the job creation happened in the informal sector. That is, people who had no formal wage contracts, social security, retirement benefits, health insurance, etc. In fact, even now, the proportion of the Indian workforce as measured by the periodic labor force survey that has a regular wage or salary job with contracts and protection is about 21-22%. Bulk of the job creation happens outside regular wage jobs within the non-agricultural space and if you, if you include the agricultural labor as well then obviously the, the, the ratio is somewhere between 20 to 80. So clearly there is a need for creation of jobs with protection with the regularity of salary payments through banking channels and with post-employment, retirement benefits, health insurance, etc. So that is one factor. So obviously, in a country that is in a catch-up mode with the rest of the world, I mentioned earlier that East Asia had catapulted to first world stage, especially Northeast Asia within a single generation. India and several other emerging economies were in a catch-up mode. So in a catch-up mode situation, competitiveness becomes important. And if technology was deployed quite extensively in competing countries or competing businesses, of course Indian businesses cannot afford to ignore that factor into their own hiring versus capital deployment decisions. In fact, some of you might be curious to know how the industrial revolution itself uh, started. I'll take a few minutes to take us back to about two, two and a half centuries ago. If anybody were to ask who is the father of the industrial revolution, some of us would try to search our brains and rack them to find some human names there. But actually if you want to know who are the real parents of industrial revolution, you must credit them to the rats, to the rats that created the plague. The plague that started in the 17th century and which lasted several decades or even almost a century is what tilted the balance of uh, cost between capital and labor because many able-bodied men perished. More than one-fourth of able-bodied men perished, pushing the relative price of labor very high, necessitating deployment of capital. And then women came into the labor force. Marriageable, marriageable age got pushed out by three to four years. And childbearing slowed because women entered into the labor market to substitute for men who had perished. And as they entered the labor market and the age of marriage got delayed and, child, and, and childbirth slowed, labor became even scarcer. So the origin of industrial revolution can actually be traced to the plague, which is what made labor costlier in the developed world and capital relatively cheaper, paving the way for industrial revolution and the capital intensive model of growth. In the case of India, Obviously, such was not the initial enabling condition. So, our growth model could, in hindsight, have found the right balance between capital and labor without necessarily importing the capital intensive model from the West, which was necessitated by an accident like the plague. But where we were therefore post-independence, since capital became scarce, we decided to incentivize capital through accelerated depreciation, etc. But after liberalization also, because technological developments became much faster, even then, the capital intensive mode of growth continued to dominate. But what was true earlier when I said, that what is scarce is valued more and what is available plentily is valued less should not necessarily be the yardstick or the criteria by which we should look at labor because if labor is to be valued as a commodity then what I said would apply but labor is a resource labor is an asset it involves humans 
with emotions and humans therefore what we what policy does to them or what the private sector does to them has social consequences also so viewing capital and labor purely from the economic framework of scarcity versus surplus is a wrong thing to do and especially these days which we are seeing in the developed world when labor is purely seen as a cost which is why developed country outsource both manufacturing and services to developing countries particularly to china for manufacturing and the philippines india etc for services we have seen the evisceration of communities evisceration of small towns and cities in the developed world and for example today's opioid problem or the fentanyl problem in the united states is attributable to the treatment of labor as a commodity therefore for india not to have to repeat the same mistakes that developed countries did in the last 20 30 years of globalization we need to find the right balance between capital and labor the second reason we need to find a better balance between capital and labor is also because it comes back to the industry in the form of demand as a famous story goes which is captured in the book the rise of the robots by martin ford published in 2016 you know uh, in a in an automobile factory the i think I, i think the factory referred to in the book was a ford motor factory and the ceo was, sh was showing off the robots deployed in the factory to the labor union leader just to make a point that the 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 company can do away with the need for labor and robots will do a much better job of production of course the labor union leader is supposed to have remarked but these robots will not buy your cars so you need to create demand for your products as well and for that you need to create incomes and creation of incomes predominantly in a capitalized capitalist economy or societies which are based on industrialization comes through employment generation india in the last 15 in the last 15 years or so or 13 to 14 years or so since 2010 has had to contend with successive shocks one was the non performing asset problem in the banking system and also the balance sheet problem in the corporate sector post 2008 financial crisis in the world the kind of policy stimulus that was given by developed countries somehow did not recreate the manufacturing growth that was expected exports did not pick up as well as it was the case between 2003 and 8 when india was growing at 8 to 9% one and a half percent per year came from export growth that was not to be the case in the second decade because developed economies somehow did not recapture the kind of growth rates they had pre 2008 plus we had our own balance sheet issues so to that extent manufacturing and export would oriented manufacturing did not create jobs the financial sector did not create too many jobs because banks were also dealing with their own balance sheet problems so bulk of the labor that was leaving the agricultural sector found its employment in services some of them in the it sector some of it in low value added services then by the time we had put behind the balance sheet issues immediately came the pandemic and the pandemic saw the migration of workers from urban india to rural india as lockdowns dominated the urban landscape and more importantly women entered the labor force but if you look at the data today therefore india suddenly has a much bigger labor force participation because women have entered the labor force in rural india and that is partly a phenomena attributable to the rise of self help groups it is not because women are finding themselves having to do domestic unpaid work but it is because of partly women working on their own account as it is called in the labor statistic through self help groups so in a way it is entrepreneurial in nature that is a positive development but where we need to therefore focus on is 
and as you can see in the consumption data in the first five months of the current financial year automobile sales in urban india have been trailing automobile sales across all categories in rural india urban employment especially in salaried wage jobs hasn't gone back to the pre covid level so labor force participation in urban india hasn't gone back particularly for women hasn't gone back to the pre covid levels and that is where the industry has to pay attention to what it is doing not necessarily consciously but initially arising out of necessity post covid because of lockdowns and restrictions the indian industry found it very convenient to enter into flexible labor arrangements work from home two days a week or three days a week etc which means subconsciously or consciously it led to more flexible employment arrangements which also led to a reduction in both the wage bill and in the benefits bill that industry had to incur so much so that if you look at the pre tax profit growth of the indian corporate sector based on a sample of 30000 plus companies from financial year 2020 to financial year 2023 corporate profits went up by 4x 5.3 lakh crores in fy20 to 20.6 lakh crores by fy23 this is for a sample of 30000 plus companies you take away the financial sector profit before tax went up by more than 3x from 4.1 lakh crores to 13.9 lakh crores excluding the financial sector this probably came due to multiple factors efficiencies deployment of technology reduction in commodity prices etc but let me also show you one statistics from this report called the india employment report produced by quest core together with fiki and i turn to table number 36 which is just a sample of the employees which are contracted out by this company questco which is a contract labor company between 2019 and 2023 which is a four year period the cagr of wage growth in the various sectors that this company was placing its employees whether it is bfci or uh, fmcg it logistics retail manufacturing etc the best wage growth per annum was 5.4% per annum and by and large compensation only in the it sector average wage was about 50000 rupees per month in the rest of the cases it was below 20000 rupees so also bulk of the savings therefore has come to the corporate sector through the curtailment of their wage bill etc but this has medium to long term consequences for aggregate demand and for sustained corporate profitability also that is one issue i want to leave this audience with the second issue i want to leave the audience with is with respect to the deployment of artificial intelligence there again i know that competitiveness requires the indian industry indian industry to adopt some of the practices that the developed country compatriots or competitors would do and therefore if you want to continue to export and be cost competitive that is an important element deployment of new technologies however artificial intelligence can both be labor augmenting and labor displacing we need to choose the right balance in fact professor eric postner at the university of chicago i will just read from his recent uh, article on this topic and i would like to leave this as a thought for uh, the audience here the long term challenges posed by artificial intelligence may be less about how to redistribute wealth and more about how to preserve jobs in a world in which human labor is no longer valued one proposal is to tax artificial intelligence more relative to labor whereas another advanced by mit economist david otter 
is to use government resources to shape the development of AI so that it complements rather than substitutes for human labor. Neither idea is promising. If the most optimistic predictions about AI's future productivity benefits are accurate, a tax will have to be tremendously high to have any impact. Moreover, AI's applications are likely to be both complements and substitutes. After all, technological innovations generally enhance some workers' productivity while eliminating others' tasks. If the government steps in to subsidize only complementary artificial intelligence, it could as easily end up displacing jobs as preserving them. If, even if humans are able to adjust to a life of leisure in the long term, the most optimistic projections of AI productivity portend massive short-run disruptions to labor markets akin to the impact of the China shock which I spoke about earlier. That means substantial and for many people permanent unemployment. There is no social safety net generous enough to protect people from the mental health effects and socially and the society from the political turmoil that would follow from such widespread disappointment and alienation." Unquote. Now, this is obviously in the context of the first world, but if we have to avoid committing the same mistakes given the large labor class that we have, the onus is as much on the government and perhaps more on the private sector to think about the medium term consequences. So the choice between capital and labor could end up being a choice of the horizons over which you want to optimize your corporate profitability. Lastly, from the government perspective, to create labor intensive jobs, and one of the reasons why earlier Indian corporations were compelled to look at capital as an option was because hiring labor was made costlier by a huge comprehensive labyrinth of regulations, all meant to protect the labor that already had a job, which perversely had the effect of not allowing more people to enter into the labor force. So in that sense, deregulation agenda for governments in the country, I am using the plural consciously because it is not just the union government but state and local government, deregulation in a manner such that the compliance cost for small and medium enterprises comes down significantly so that labor intensive manufacturing can become competitive in low tech or semi tech industries is an obligation on the part of the government. On the part of the public of course to maintain their own physical and mental health because recently I wrote an article in Indian Express about the mental health consequences of the widespread use of smartphones and consumption of ultra processed foods because without sound physical and mental health there is no demographic dividend because this is a problem that afflicts Indian youth more than the elderly people. So on the part of the public it is about maintaining their mental and physical health and equipping themselves with skills both cognitive and not cognitive. On the part of the private sector, it is about choosing the horizon over which you want to balance capital deployment and labor deployment. On the part of the government, it is about the obligation to strike the right trade-off between letting go and making sure that we have legitimate economic activity happening in the country. So if we have to avoid the social consequences of capital intensive or technology intensive growth, all these three components have to do their part of the responsibility. So we need a bigger compact between the private sector, the government and the public so that we can enjoy the demographic dividend and achieve our dreams of becoming a developed nation by 2047 all the while maintaining both social stability and economic stability. Thank you very much. Thank you.
So I'm going to start with a couple of questions, and uh, by which time, if the audience has thought of any questions, please raise your hands. So, you know, you talked of labor and capital, and I think one of the conundrums uh, we are dealing with as industry, uh, and also I'm sure the consequences are with the government, there's no free flow of labor across borders, right? Free flow of labor, right? If there was a lot of problems of jobs would be solved. People will go where there are jobs and they'll move. As economies open up, there's free flow of capital, which is good. India has opened up, capital comes in, you set up facilities. The big issue is free flow of goods, right? You need to be part of global supply chains, lower tariff barriers. But if you have free flow of goods, and you alluded to that, because if you are a catch-up economy, how do you then catch up with another country which may have better infrastructure and things like that? And so when you have free flow of goods, sometimes it impacts jobs. Right? Because if you were to make stuff in the easiest place to make it, and if you had access to all the markets without a problem, you would make it where it's easiest to make it. So I think this is the challenge. How do you address this? And India has this problem, right? I mean, you could have an economy where, you know, you could have an economy or everyone would want to access the Indian market. It's a large growing market. Uh, but you need people to invest to make in India, otherwise how do you create the job? So how, do, how does one deal with this, this kind of conundrum? No, I'm sure, I mean, it's a, it, I, you are right to characterize it as a conundrum, and uh, I don't think we have uh, simplistic answers to this, because as you correctly put it, capital has been made mobile, and initially, the developed world, if you even look at the current uh, uh, conversation in the world about deglobalization, it seems to be happening more with respect to trade and goods, and maybe even in services, which includes labor. But somehow, there is no deglobalization in terms of capital flows. Because that is still very open and unrestricted. And as you correctly pointed out, the same thing is not, same uh, rules of the game are not applied with respect to labor flows. But that is something that we need to continue to pursue as other countries look at India as a market for access. So in that sense, we need to put our cards very clearly on the table that if our markets are to be open for others' goods and services, and their markets have to be open for our labor services as well, both in terms of actual uh, uh, labor flows or services flow, both ways. I think that, is, that should be part of all bilateral negotiations. But in general, I think it is also true that, uh, as Jonathan Haidt wrote very clearly in his book, The Righteous Mind, the benefits of immigration to any society follows an inverted U-shaped uh, curve. So as far as uh, job creation within our own country is concerned, while that can only be a small component, the flow, flow of labor across borders, the bulk of the action, as you were saying before we came on to the stage, is how to find the means to incentivize and facilitate labor-intensive manufacturing sectors to take off. And there I would concede that the bulk of the action lies in deregulation, which is a responsibility of the government. But where the responsibility is somewhat greater on the private sector is in large-scale industries, whether it is services sector or manufacturing, where I think uh, we need to make sure that is there and this cannot be obviously mandated because if it is mandated then it will have unintended consequences it has to be voluntary and i think that is where i would like to simply leave it on the table without elaborating further adam smith wrote the wealth of nations but before that he wrote the theory of moral sentiments thank you my i have a few questions here but before that uh, the second question i had to you is uh, more about the informal economy do we have a sense of how big it was, how much has it shrunk? Because uh, over the last few years, as we have seen the formalization of the informal economy, the consequences have been felt, but it's, it's difficult for us as industry to understand how big it was yeah. 
and when we see the GDP growth rate, that's more a GDP growth rate of the formal part of the economy. So I don't know how big is that, and do you have a sense no, of that? I think by definition, it is very difficult to uh, get uh, a mag order of magnitude with respect to the size of the informal economy, because definitely with, more on, with the introduction of goods and services tax, with the introduction of the goods and services tax, uh, there is definitely a greater formalization. And with uh, more and more informal workers being registered or MSMEs being registered on the Udyam portal and the Isham portal, etc., there is greater formalization that has happened. Because when you say formalization, it is about being captured in some form or the other in the official statistics. If you keep it loosely defined that way, then there is greater formalization. But what I alluded to when I read out the the growth in annual growth in wages between FI19 and FI23, quoting the data from the Quest Core, what might also be happening simultaneously post-COVID is the informalization of the workforce within the formal sector. That is something that we need to uh, watch out for. No, I agree with that. I agree with that. I'm going to get into some of the questions. Uh, uh, this question is how and what threat you think of the advancement of growing gig economy culture? You, uh, I think that's what, that's what we that. spoke yeah. about, yeah. 